Well, at long last, we have come to the final installment of the Legend of the Galactic Heroes novels, at least until the side stories get licensed for a U.S. release anyway. As with Book 9, I'm not going to be doing the previously on recap, as this novel is pretty much wrapping up, or trying to wrap up, all of the plot lines in the series at this point, so I'm going to need to discuss the plot commingled with everything else. This means there are going to be spoilers for the past nine books. So, well, if you're watching this video, consider this your warning. There will be some spoilers here as well. I'm going to try to minimize the number of spoilers for the ending, but I kind of have to talk about that because when you're having a book that is the ending of a series, you need to talk about how well the ending as a whole lands and how, in terms of how it's executed and how emotionally satisfying it feels. Appropriately enough, the last book in the Legend of the Galactic Heroes series is basically about legacies and planning for the future, as is fitting for a series conclusion. Previous books, following the death of Yang Wen Li, have focused their attention on the attempts by the Isolone Republic to preserve the fires of democracy when the Republic that encompasses, or that is the last bastion of democracy, consists of the inhabitants basically of a Death Star that has a wave motion gun instead of a super laser with a side plot related to all this with conflict concurring within the Empire spurred by the action of the Church of Terra. Those, act th those conflicts led basically to an unintentional civil war led by the forces in charge of the occupation of Hynesen and the former Free Pines of Alliance, Alliance led by Oscar von Royenthal and the force of the Empire uh, led by Royenthal's bestie, Wolfgang Mittenmeier. Not because Mittenmeier wanted to fight his friend, but because the head of Imperial Intelligence and all-around cynically pragmatic bastard Paul von Overstein, Overstein, whatever, persuaded Kaiser Reinhard von Lohenbrock to do so. And I bring all of this up after saying I'm not doing the previously on image thing, because like all of the repercussions of that come to a head here, because the climax of that is Royenthal dies in action. And thus, the, somebody new has to be appointed to be head of the occupation of Hynesen and the FPA, and that person is Overstein. Throughout the entire series, up to this point, Overstein has been in the... Not, not so much the shadows, but he has been backstage. He, he's been present. He's been there. He's been, taken actions. But he's never been at the forefront. He's occasionally, like, he's pushed characters in different directions, but he's never been in a position where he has been center stage. And one of the, the key points I think that's been come up over the course of the previous books is that center stage is a place that Oberstein does not feel comfortable, does not want to be. He likes running things from behind the scenes. Um, he's, we, we never see him commanding a fleet in any of the big major pitched battles. We never see him on the bridge of a ship in the middle of, a, of combat or that sort of thing. He's never the brilliant military tactician or even not not at squad level, not at fleet level, so to speak, or a well, squadron level, not at massive fleet action level, I should say. And so his actions here, like they fit with his very cynical, pragmatic ap attitude where like during the Civil War uh, within the uh, Empire earlier in the series where, like, Overstein basically tells um, Lohengram to knowingly let his opponent commit a war crime, a massive war crime and a horrific um, atrocity, knowing that the thing is going to happen, knowing he can take action to stop it, because by letting it happen, um, Reinhardt can draw the populace to their, his cause. And it's an interesting note there, because that bit is all saying, okay, Reinhardt is good at reading the masses and reading people. And Reinhardt does a thing here that is very much against the principles that um of the Reinhardt, but, uh, but Oberstein does thing here that is against the principles that Reinhardt has stood up for, that he pushed for when he overthrew the Goldenbaum dynasty, and which he does specifically to try and draw out the uh, 
the Iceland Republic military, which is he takes 500, 5,000, sorry, respect, uh, suspected members of resistant groups, along with various members of the former Free Plan Alliance government, not like the scumbags who were with Job, Job Trunick or that sort of thing, but like the ones who were um, close with Yang Wen Li and thus also close to the now commanders of of the of Ice alone, and takes them all prisoner and threatens to execute them, or prisoner is the wrong term, hostage, and threatens to execute them until one at a time until the Ice alone Republic surrenders. Oberstein knows this ain't going to happen. Um, they have, hold to their beliefs in a way which certainly Reinhardt finds noble and admirable. But he also knows that the Australian Republic military ain't just going to sit there and let him do this. And while, and Reinhardt is not in a position to stop him necessarily, because also, while all of this is going on, Reinhardt has two big issues. Well, one noble, admirable, like, one good thing, one bad thing. The good thing is Reinhard and Hildegard von Meridorf have gotten married. Hildegard is pregnant with um, Reinhardt's first um, first kid. Oh, Reinhardt's kid. Um, and so there's going to be an heir to the throne, and which means theoretically Reinhardt's line is secure, um, from a succession standpoint, because after all, it's an empire, it's an it's a auto autocracy, so that stuff matters in a way that it, where it, in a democracy it doesn't. And so Reinhardt, on one hand, has that on his mind. On the other hand, also Reinhardt is chronically ill with an increasingly debilitating disease, which has not yet been diagnosed at the start of this novel. They may have mentioned the name of it at the end of the last book, with the implication that it was going to be eventually terminal. Um, which puts Reinhardt in a situation where he can't push back on Oversteen because he's indisposed. Either he is either on his honeymoon with his with his new bride, new wife, or too sick to travel. And then there's during all this we have the Church of Terra, who they don't want Reinhardt to have an heir. They want the galaxy to be sown into chaos so that they can manipulate this chaos to put themselves on top and bring all the galaxy together behind worship of Terra. Um, so if Reinhardt has an heir, then, or I should say, if Reinhardt doesn't have an heir, then when he dies, either through their assassination or through illness, then the theoretically the Empire would fall into chaos, um, which they could take advantage of. They're planning to take action. They are actually less concerned now with the Isolone Republic because it's theoretically, from a galactic political standpoint, a non-entity. So this all leads down to the main crux of the book. How do you end a war? Now, if it isn't, this is a true, well, actually, maybe even if it is a, an existential war, like with the Second World War, we're fighting the Nazis, you still, at some point, have to, it's, you have to talk. The way you end wars is through talking. And the stakes of the war, the ideologies and how invested people are in their positions on a different side of the conflicts, determined what it takes to get to, to get both sides to the table to sit down and talk and mean it. Because like all people have to do, you have to stop fighting, you have to sit down, you have to talk things out like civilized people. And all of the key, the crux of ending the war and getting to this is getting things to the point where both sides are willing to talk things over. Maybe both, maybe the war has just dragged on for so long and has had said such a cost of men, materiel, um, of economic cost, well, as materiel, um, just general will to fight that nobody can handle anymore. And they just, both sides are done. We sit down, we talk this over like the First World War. Or, one side over just overpowers the other, gets them to effectively tap out and agree to talk. Um, and again, that's through either just straight up overpowering, invading, getting to their capital and saying, alright, we're going to, putting them at gunpoint and basically saying, hey, we're going to, we're going to talk now. Or by tapping and by sapping their resources and again tapping their will to sapping their will to fight to the point where they go okay we're we're done we're done what do you want that is 
by comparison, that's the Second World War and the Vietnam War um, by contrast there. With this book, the key at this point now is just getting the Empire to sit down and talk. Prior to this, through everything up until Reinhardt taking the throne, the, and even past that to before the fall of the Free Planets Alliance, the ultimate thrust of the conflict between the Free Planets Alliance and the Empire was a Im immovable ideological conflict. The, as far as the Goldenbaum dynasty is concerned, the Free Planets Alliance are a bunch of upstart rebels who don't know their place and who are a bunch of commoners and peasants and spreading this this, this horrifying dissident um, heretical ideology of democracy that must be snuffed out because the, the Golden Baum dynasty doesn't, and, and the system of government that they had built up, doesn't tolerate dissidents. It's a fascist, ideolog an ideologically fascist um, autocracy, or autocracy slash aristocracy. Um, and like, also the other thing with fascism is fascism needs something to fight. Fascism needs an outside enemy to force the people to combine their forces against. If they cannot create, if they don't have one, they'll make one, as you see in, well, actually Germany did this with the, with the stab in the back myth about the Jewish population and with Hitler's racial theories. You, and then you see other similar things with, against communists and socialists in Spain you're seeing some of this happening within the United States, within the alt-right and American neo-Nazism, that sort of thing. So there's you have that. And you'll also in Japanese history, appropriate to the author, you actually had this also with the shogunate, with all sorts of outside forces, and you actually had fascism combined with um, a form of isolationism where they're closing the borders to out to all outside trade, no outside trade and commerce, and then until eventually limited outside trade trade and concert commerce with um, the Western powers, because during the Warring States period you had Western powers bringing guns in, which really shifted the balance of power uh, and allowed basically the thing that allowed um, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu and his former master Nobu, uh, Oda Nobunaga do, to do so well which is why Nobunaga knows to close this off because if he wants to end the fighting his way uh, he can't let anybody else bring in guns either and then limited and then also limited outside contact not just in terms of inside uh, outsiders coming into trade but also outsiders going out to trade with, like, if you notice, the Japanese imperial military ambitions and their military adventures of that time basically were to Korea in areas that they'd previously had conquered and held to begin with. So, in other words, we're... They're not pushing... Their, their military adventures aren't into new territories. It is territories which they can make the... which they can internally make the claim of, we already own these... So we're just taking them back, and then they can do this to let off steam from their internal military adventurous urges. Again, all of which is part of fascism. None of this is good, by the way. Just to make that clear. This is their internal motivations for doing terrible, terrible things to Korea. All this, anyway, leads to where we are with the problem with this book, because at this point in the series, most of the barriers to sitting down and talking are gone. The Free Plants Alliance government that was so resistant under an ideological basis of we, we rebelled from the Empire, we have been in an existential war with the Empire for generations, we have, nev we have literally never been at 
never not been at war with the Empire because the Empire has always been trying to snuff us out. Why can't we trust them now? Um, how can we trust them now? That's now a moot point because while Yangman Lee had Reinhardt von Lohengrim on the on the ropes, Hildegard and Mariendorf with I, with I believe Mittenmeyer came dashing through um, the then undefended Isolon corridor, popped up to Hydesen, pointed a whole bunch of weapons at the planet service, and said, "Yo, uh, how about we stop? How about you call off um, call off your boy?" That's several books back. So, consequently, that Free Plans Alliance government is effectively out of the picture. In fact, last book, um, Mittenmeyer, having had quite enough of Job Trunick's bullshit for legitimate reasons, um, considering that it had been fairly clearly established but not explicitly spelled out that Trunick was a puppet of the uh, Church of Terra, popped um, Trunick in the head with a ray gun. Um, that barrier is out of the que is out of the equation. Um, even before this, Yang Wen Li was ready to talk. In fact, on and on his death, when he died, he was traveling to the Zen for talks with Reinhard before being ambushed by the Church of Terra under a false flag of the um of the Empire and assassinated. Reinhardt on the other hand, well, yes, he's a person who's always looking for the next big battle and the next big opponent to fight. He's also probably at this point, like, is the Iserloan Republic, the military forces there, actually like, really enough of a challenge that's worth my time? I mean, yes, people have for generations, somewhat literally, thrown their forces at Iserloan and been wiped out and just had mill millions, possibly billions of people die at the hands of Thor's hammer from the Free Plants Alliance. And we've done the same thing ourselves when we tried to take it back. And the only person who's ever been successfully able to attack, to capture the Isolone Republic at all was Yang Wen Li through the type of deception and trickery that is not Reinhardt's thing. That's not his jam. So, if that's out, then... And also, considering their forces aren't really big enough that he, at this point, Reinhardt thinks for a big pitched battle, why is this worth my time? In theory, I can, we can just sit down and negotiate. And indeed, over the course of this book, there are several attempts to just sit down and have negotiations. None of them get started. They're all non-starters. Instead, this all sums up and comes to a climax with a big epic bitched battle within the scrappy ragtag forces of the Iceland Republic commanded by Julian Mintz, Yang's ward, and the current and the Iceland Republic's current military commander on one side, and Reinhardt himself on the other, basically because they've never had it, so let's never had a fight, so we we need a main event. We need a main event. We have the scrappy underdog with potential and the established champion. Let's have them go at it. Because I don't know. Really, I don't know. This fight isn't forced by the church. It's not forced by I by Oberstein's hostage nonsense. It's not due to the imperial military refusing to honor a flag of truce. It started by some Iceland Republic military going to rescue a civilian vessel, broadcasting a distress signal to the entrance of the Iceland's corridor, and getting shot at by an imperial patrol. I get that big, climactic military engagements that turn the tide of wars start out of small moments like this all the time. The Battle of Gettysburg started because some Confederate foraging parties who were stealing supplies and paying with worthless money that wasn't even useful as toilet paper ran into John Buford's cavalry division and got stuck in. They weren't intending to start a major battle. Instead, they had orders not to, but it happened. With this book, though, Look, one of the things that come up a lot in science fiction novels, especially space opera, um, and great examples of where this comes up are the Expanse series and Jack McDevitt's Academy series, is that space is big, really big, and that doesn't mean this, I'm trying to quote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Space is big, and potentially small problems can have larger consequences. 
So if you're in a position to help someone who is in trouble and they send a distress signal, you help. And similarly, if you have a problem and you send a distress signal, you theoretically mean it. You are in trouble. You're not doing, if you're doing this as, if you're faking distress calls an ambush, or if you are am firing some on someone or ambushing someone who's responding to a distress call normally in science fiction, in these types of science fiction, in these space opera series, you are a goddamn monster. And that's, yeah, that's how things are played in the dis expanse. Even with the Game of Thrones as gray and darker gray morality of that series of the expanse, breaking those rules is the equivalent of somebody killing an animal in the story arc of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It is a thing that is done to establish that in spite of all the shades of gray and the questions over whether somebody's moral position is better, stronger than the others, somebody's doing this shit, then they are a piece of garbage and they need to go. And all of this is made more jarring by the fact that the whole mission objective of the Republic forces in this battle is board Reinhardt's cruiser, send your boarding parties in, led by Julian Mintz, by your commander himself, Fight your way through the Marines and whatever on board this ship. Get to Reinhardt face to face in order to negotiate and end hostilities. In the heat of the moment, when I'm reading this book, I am engrossed in this big pitched space battle, all the um, fighting with guns and axes in the hulls of the ship, and I'm a, it's a riveting, engrossing page turn. Once all that's over, though, at a moment, just, I set the book down. I had a moment to pause and reflect about it. My reaction then kind of cools to, that's kind of dumb, actually. Considering how much smarter the space battles have been up to this point, having it kind of just turn into a kind of dopey boarding action? Not so much. And the thing is, there are plenty of other space opera series, some of them I made believe come after this, and but which are not in any way informed by this, that have handled this better. Or, am, I, am I informed? I mean... The authors clearly haven't had a chance to read this novel because it hasn't been translated yet. Um, and the anime series wasn't legally available yet. Like, I'm talking the Honor Harrington series, which is similarly Napoleonic naval battles, except in space, doesn't do this. And they are also a series that is perfectly willing to have the climax of a major novel not be in space. That have it be on the ground in a political conflict or a land combat action or that sort of thing. They are willing to take a, take a sharp turn into Sharp's rifles. They're willing to take a sharp turn um, into, some, into something more swashbuckly, but like, or where, where the, the climax of, actually even with honor, even with Horatio Hornblower, there were Hornblower novels where the climax isn't a sword fight, it's a duel. Whether with muskets or swords, it's just a duel on land between two people. And it's fairly clear that while like, Gang Wen Lee is not have the same poise and posture and career path as Horatio Hornblower, it's clear that these books are cut from the same cloth. They are more Horatio Hornblower in space than Star Trek is, as much as Gene Roddenberry likes to call it Horatio Hornblower in space. Well, Gene Roddenberry and um, uh, Nicholas Meyer like to call it Horatio Hornblower in space. It's not, um, these books are more that. But having it be like this makes the final battle seem less like it's narratively earned and more like it's included out of obligation. Like the editor, uh, like Yoshiki Tanaka's editor, after he turned in the manuscript, read it, came to his house or called him to his office and sat down and said, Yoshiki, or sorry, Tanaka san, Tanaka san, you have a good book here. It's really good. It's a good conclusion of the series. I just have one thing. We need something missing. We need a, a, a big space battle. All the other books in the series have had some sort of manner of big, epic, pitched space battle here. Well, yes, I understand. But this is meant to be. This is meant to be much more the denouement of the series. It's meant to wind down these plot threads. And I think a conflict of words is just as important here. Um, then a big epic space battle with a high death toll. Well, yeah, yes, I understand that. On the other hand, we have. I mean, there's an expectation the readers have to have a big, exciting moment, and we, we need to have that kind of emotional 
climax here with, with, with heavy narrative stakes and risk of loss of life. Well, we have the the, the amb we have the the two main military actions here, the, the ground actions. We have the attack by the Church of Terra on the hospital, or the, on, on the pregnant um, Kaiserin and and Rose Reinhardt's sister, and then we have the attack on the hospital with the attempt to murder Reinhardt and the infant um, heir to the throne. At the conclusion of the book, where it has Oberstein's um, the, the the ultimate fate of Oberstein here as well, and that sort of thing. We have those big emotional climactic moments with stakes, and it also ties into the what what the audience's thoughts on the Church of Terra and gives them that emotional payoff as well. Like, yes, yes, I understand that, I understand that, but I means it's the Legend of the Galactic Heroes. We need a big galactic battle after all. Um, so, please submit a new draft with a with an appropriate climactic sequence in the series. That that, that that's got to be it. That's, that's got to be how this played out because it feels like it is not blatantly shoehorned in there. Tanaka San is a is a good enough writer that he's able to fit the that he's able to ultimately kind of make the battle fit, but that doesn't make it feel like any less of an afterthought. So was the ending satisfying? I guess. I guess the book gives us some sense of denouement. It lets the story wind down. It does not answer the question of how the Empire is going to fare after Reinhardt's death, but that's okay. In a way, it gives us a finale where both of our dual protagonists, Yang Wen Li and Reinhardt Lohengram, basically won. Reinhardt wanted to set out from the very first book to eliminate the Golden Low Dynasty and reform the Empire, and he'd done that two books ago. And basically, him having a kid and... Theoretically, having a successor to the throne, having a successor to the throne, and the care of Merendorf, and um, with uh, Mittenmeyer, and all that gives that that sense of okay, there there is a future for the empire in some manner or another. Yang wanted to make sure that the seed of democracy was saved and have a chance to grow once again to fruition, and by the end of the series, that has happened as well. Democracy has endured. Um, without getting too much into the spoilers here, I'm not going to say how we get to this, but I will say it is even had a chance to be planted once again on Hynesen. Which I think is a big victory on Wen Li's part. But, and what the question that this book puts forth from the get-go is it winds things down, isn't Will our characters get what they've been fighting for all this time? It's what did it cost? Was it worth it? I think the book would have handled this well anyway. Answer well anyway, without shoving a sticking a big epic space battle up there just to up the price a little bit. But it's not entire. But because of that, it makes it less satisfying. I'm interested to hear what you think. Let me know in the comments below. If you'd like to pick up this book and the rest of the series, also, links will be in the show notes to get the book from Amazon and Write Stuff. And buy anything through those links, whether you buy the rest of the series or whatever will help support the show. First three books have a audiobook release, which I, again, strongly recommend if you're just jumping in. Or, if so, why are you? I'm reviewing book 10. But if you haven't had a chance to listen to the audiobooks as well, it's worth picking it up. I'm kind of finger crossed, hoping that eventually we'll just get the rest of them. They'll just pop up on um, Audible as audiobooks, but we'll see.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.